Uh, welcome to the Thrombosis Canada um, uh, second sessions of the small group. And this is um, uh, extended VT prophylaxis, uh, post-hospitalization and post-unprovoked uh, uh, VT. I'm uh, Peter Gross and uh, uh, Rick Ikasaka is my co-presenter. Thank you. And we'll go with, thanks. Uh, with our uh, disclosures next. So here's our disclosures. I'll leave them up for a minute or two. And how uh, Thrombosis Canada uh, received uh, uh, support from uh, the above companies and the uh, potential conflicts of interest about that. And how uh, we're going to mitigate potential bias. And please, in the evaluation forms, if you think there's any bias, please, please say so. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through uh, my uh, first case. Um, this is meant to be a discussion. So people could please uh, interrupt, put their hand up, um, something. Uh, uh, but we're going to go through um, this first case, which is uh, a case of uh, um, uh, in-hospital and out-of-hospital extended prophylaxis. And the case changes a little bit. So, so we have a 76-year-old woman. She has a past medical history of COPD. She's never had venous thrombosis. She's not obese. She's hospitalized with pneumonia. Um, she's sick, uh, but she's on the ward. She's not in the ICU. She's on supplemental oxygen. Her um, uh, activity order is bed rest with bathroom privileges. So uh, should she receive prophylaxis in hospital? Uh, what and what's about her VTE risk? Uh, in hospital, how, what percent would you say her risk of getting a VTE in hospital is? Open it up for questions or anyone to mention anything or? Can I see the chat? Even in the chat, you can ask questions. You can unmute yourself. Hi, it's Ben. I'll, Hi, just, ben. I'll, I'll just jump in. Sorry. Sure. I, I don't know. I would say that, yes, you should definitely receive VT prophylaxis. I think it's standard of care for all hospitalized medical patients to receive yeah. VT prophylaxis, irrespective yeah. of what their um, activity order is. So if she was yeah. AAT, I would still yeah. say, I would still yeah. say yes to that. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. I think your, your, your question is what is her VTE risk in hospital? I, I, I suppose that has been studied. Uh, but it has been um, a lot of time since I've looked at the VT prophylactic literature because it's just become so cemented that these patients need it that you, you almost don't even think about it unless they can't have it because of bleeding yeah. risk. Yeah. So, so I don't know the answer to that question, but when you ask what, I would say she, she should receive a low molecular weight heparin. Uh, I, I don't see any contraindications to that in the description. Anyone else have any comments about that? Yeah, Kylie. You're muted. I'm mute. No, I was gonna say, yeah, I know there's a UBC article that went out about changing practice and starting to calculate their VTE risk again. So I'd be curious if you guys are using that in Eastern Canada. Um, and I, I'm curious to hear what you guys say about the DOACs because I think there's probably gonna be a role for them in the next five to 10 years, but curious what the literature is out for DBT prophylaxis in hospital. We aren't using it. We're using whatever's cheapest, of course, so. Sure. Anyone else have any points and then we can, uh discuss those points with my little answer. All right, so, uh, so by Kai Hai uh, guidelines, hospital accreditation, she has to receive prophylaxis, right? So at the moment today, if she does not receive prophylaxis and your hospital is audited, then that's a problem, right? So um, uh, risk gratification and thought and anything like that is not does not play in a part in accreditation. Um, hospitals have to monitor uh, and uh, audit uh, prophylaxis, uh, and and there's only very few uh, circumstances where it's not supposed to be given. So that's kind of why I brought it up. Um, the Padua score, which is one score, there's a whole pile of scores. Um, her Padua score is six. You can look it up. There's uh, I don't think it's on Thrombos Canada, but I worked it off of MedCal. Uh, her Padua score is six, which is, uh, according to that literature, is uh, an 11% of 
BTE uh, in the next three months without prophylaxis. So you got to realize that a lot of this is uh, uh, was all day studies. So with venograms, okay. So for venogram positive risk is eleven percent, um, and uh, uh, Lomic would have a uh, uh, weight adjusted at prophylactic dose is is what would most people would recommend. So the DOACs have been studied, um, and uh, there there's a pile of uh, uh, non uh, uh, not better trials, for lack of a better word, of the approved anti 10 10 8 x that we have. Uh, this Patrixaban study and a uh, 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 low dose uh, Reroxaban study, more recent, that plucked people with higher higher uh, in hospital risks. Uh, and again, it was outpatient prophylaxis as well, and there was benefit. So Patrixaban in the US is approved for this. Uh, it's not approved in Canada, they didn't go to Health Canada. So I think the future might, in this area, might move towards DOAX, uh, but it's certainly not there yet. Also, a little bit of a historical thing is, um, I would say if I presented this to our most Canada six years ago, the standard answer would be on fractionated heparin uh, because that was the cheapest drug at the time. And then Safer Healthcare now wanted um, pre-filled syringes and that made the price differential between uh, and fractionated heparin and lomicoid heparin uh, smaller. And so lomicoid heparin became the sort of most common drug, okay? So weren't things the bleeding rates, changed. Weren't the bleeding rates with the DOAX noted to be higher uh, in, in prophylaxis trials? They, they were, which is why they're, which is why it's, it's not used. And in the, in the approved uh, Batrixaban trial, they specifically chose people with a higher BTE rate, uh, a higher, uh, score like the pad was for that 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 they would get a bigger benefit. So you had to ch choose higher risk people, and then there, yes, it was a bit more bleeding, but it was more effectiveness in venous thrombosis as well. So it'll, you know, it, I don't know how quickly uh, it'll come. There's no trials of DOAX in hospital. The medical population is a sick population, right? This woman could end up having anything else that makes her very high bleeding risk. So it's a, it's, I think when we quit up and it'll take a while, but to answer the question, I think in, a, in 10 years time, this might be DOAX, but, but I don't think we know that today. All right, so just to move the conversation forward, we change the case a little bit. So what if this was COVID pneumonia that she had in the hospital um, and now she's um, uh, well and she's uh, ambulating, oh, sorry. So let's just go back, I skipped it, I skipped. Sorry, it's, it's four days later. Uh, she's well, uh, she's uh, going to go home, um, she, uh, it's not COVID yet, um, and uh, should she get prophylaxis as an outpatient? So this is a medically ill person, she got prophylaxis as an inpatient, should she get prophylaxis as an outpatient? Anybody? So I kind of gave it away, so we can skip it if you want. So there's no evidence to support outpatient prophylaxis in someone with a lower Padua score at the moment. The Patrixaban study would have enrolled people with higher, and so she might have been eligible for Patrixaban in the United States, but not that's not a good thing. Okay, so here now it changes. So what if uh, they later in her hospitalization, her uh, COVID test comes back positive, and she. Uh, it is COVID pneumonia, but now she's again well, uh, and she's going to go home. Should she receive outpatient prophylaxis? Anybody? Uh, you're muted again, Kylie. My favorite trick. I was just gonna say, I don't think there's any evidence. So we are not. But... Anybody else want to make a comment? Whoopsie. Sorry. Hasn't this been looked at with DOAX and there's no benefit? Yeah, so uh, this trial uh, that was published last month uh, in uh, JAMA, uh, Jim Connors, who gave the, 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 one of the talks uh, at the Trumbull Scanner meeting was the first author. They, uh, it's active 4 b study. They uh, randomized patients to uh, aspirin uh, or low dose of fixed band, uh, or nothing, 
and uh, the VTE rate was under a percent in the next 45 days in a placebo group. Uh, uh, there were like one or two events altogether. Uh, uh, so it was stopped early because it would never have enough power to answer the question of what, which of the three uh, placebo aspirin or fixed band would be beneficial. So the rate is too low to even study. Okay, so the answer is no. Um, sorry. So here's the, the next question. So what if instead of um, COVID, uh, she was diagnosed in hospital with the lung malignancy, okay? Uh, she uh, has a biopsy which shows it's a lung malignancy, the CAT scan shows it's a, let's say it's stage three disease. Um, uh, they're discussing whether she's gonna have surgery or, or go on chemotherapy or radiation and she's gonna go home. Uh, should she receive prophylaxis? Need a little bit more information to calculate coronavirus score. Sure. So let's say uh, her CBC is normal. Uh, she's not obese. It's lung cancer, right? So she gets a point because it's lung cancer. That's out. that's all. But you know she wouldn't apply to what coronavirus score has been uh, validated in the most recent studies for, which is to prevent venous thrombosis in people receiving uh, uh, chemotherapy, right? But she's certainly risky, right? So I think that the, this is a truly unclear answer. You, in your heart, you know she's riskier at, than someone who has a coronary score of two because she just is discharged from hospital. She's just recovered from an pneumonia. She's got a cancer. Um, there has been no treatment for the cancer. Uh, she, you feel that she's risky, but you know I think there's no trial at the moment validating or asking a question, uh, should she receive outpatient prophylaxis? But I think uh, I couldn't fault someone who, who offered her it to her. Okay. Okay. Any other if question? She, if yeah. she was getting chemo, would you give her prophylaxis? If she was giving chemo, then we could get her corona score and figure out what uh, uh, what it was, but it's still a one. Uh, so, you know, I'd offer, uh, it, I probably wouldn't even offer it to her. Uh, if she was getting chemo and she was an outpatient. So the interesting thing with this is that if she, let's say she stayed in hospital and had her her uh, her lobectomy um, and then was going home, then I think in most places she would get a month of a month of anticoagulation after her lobectomy, right? So so I think that again makes it a bit unclear. So the surgery uh, is is enough to push us over the edge to give her the give her the the, the prophylaxis. Uh, but just going home and waiting uh, isn't. Um, so that's that's why I brought this up. It's an unclear thing. It's like a, it needs it's it's good for discussion because there's no um, there's no study justifying what in our hearts we feel is riskier than normal. All right. And so for outpatient prophylaxis, if she had a lobectomy. Um, uh, Ontario just made it kind of easier to get an extend uh, EAP for long liquid heparin. Um, and then there are some centers that are doing pilot trials of, uh, of uh, low dose DOACs for outpatient prophylaxis. Um, and there's a large international trial that's about to uh, start in Europe, uh, but will enroll in, be enrolling people in Canada to ask uh, the optimal duration of, of uh, uh, thromboprophylaxis in someone who has cancer surgery. And sorry, Peter, is that, is that calculating? I mean, I'm sure you'll get to it a bit later, but Caprini scores and DBT prophylaxis post surgery is something we're challenged with. So right. that's with specific to malignancy yeah. related surgeries. Okay. Yeah. So this is specifically malignancy related surgeries. Um, and the, sort of the goal of that study is really to, to see whether it's necessary in the lower risk surgeries. Um, so it's going to be randomizing people to in lower risk, or mostly lower risk surgeries. Okay. I thought the data was most well established in, in abdominal and pelvic cancer surgeries with extended okay. duration. I didn't realize that people are doing this also with 
with with other surgeries like lung. Yeah, it's a, it's it's uh, it depends on the center, but a lot of people uh, who get lung cancer surgery will will get outpatient prophylaxis. And that's for a month, Peter. Uh, that that's what's done. Uh, you know, that, that's the unknown question, right? Uh, but you, you're right, the best data exists for, for gynecological and abdominal surgeries, uh, cancers, um, uh, but, it, but it's, it's, it's unknown in other places and other tumor sites and tumor surgeries. Okay, all right. Rich, should I give it back to you? Uh, sure, if you'd like to, um, and then uh... I may actually, I see you have beautiful graphics in some of your slides. I may still still welcome this to steal them. discussion, discussion uh, for Absolutely. You're welcome that, to steal get to that them. scenario here. But okay, nonetheless, this, this, wait, there's a couple of things in the chats. Oh, uh, sure. Yeah, so Aggie's suggesting to uh, use the improved to identify low risk patients. I think that's, you know, the problem with that, I think, is, um, is knowledge translation and for lack of a better word, stupidity of doctors. So, um, you know, if people think about prophylaxis and have documented that they thought about prophylaxis and they identify someone as low risk by something that's validated and they document that that's okay and they don't order prophylaxis, I think that's fine. But if someone just checks the box and say low risk uh, and they haven't really evaluated the patient, uh, then, um, then, then we're doing a disservice. So. Bill Geertz used to say, um, over prophylaxing uh, some low risk people is worth it uh, 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 compared to uh, missing prophylaxing high risk people because they're thinking too hard about whether they should or they shouldn't. So I, I, I think you know that 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 uh, electronic EMRs and all this kind of stuff make uh, uh, proper selection. Um, uh, appropriate and if you're smart and you're doing it, that's wonderful. Uh, and that's what the guidance documents actually suggest. But I think we all we always have to think or worry about in a KT uh, aspect of the broader uh, broader uh, population of whether an intern's going to understand um, uh, the correct score to uh, avoid prophylaxis and hospitalizing that patient. Sorry, Rick. Oh, no problems. All right. So. Um, so I will pull this up and I, I did the in-person one. So I'm going to steal uh, Peter's beautiful graphics that he had prepared for the, on, the online session uh, last weekend uh, when we get to that part of the discussion. Uh, but nonetheless, um, so the other part of our talk is really about extended prophylaxis around and after unprovoked venous thromboembolism. Uh, and so I present you with a very similar case uh, such as the, that was just presented, except that they're not uh, they're not admitted and uh, needing prof discussing prophylaxis. So, you know, 62 year old female smoker, history of an unprovoked DVT a year, year ago, uh, and is consulted to you or isn't being inquired as to whether or not they're gonna stop their warfarin or, or insert other DOAC. And so, you know, there's several questions that we, we can ask in this sort of situation, which is how long should we treat idiopathic DVTs? And, uh, you know, are there patients that we can identify that would benefit from extended thromboprophylaxis? And now uh, I understand that uh, we, we have an audience here from all across Canada. So uh, whether or not uh, we can obtain said things is also one of the, the great adventures of practicing thrombosis medicine. Um, but uh, I, I'm going to leave it and open it to you um, to chat a little bit about the, the first one. So you know, this, in this case, we have someone who's presenting to us uh, who's been treated for a long time for reassessment, but the same could be said uh, as to any DVT or PE patient that's presented to you with an unprovoked clot uh, as to how long that you wish to treat them for. Um, so I'll open it up to you in terms of, you know, what your practice is, what your thoughts are, and we can sort of discuss from there. I'll leave the chat so if you can tell me if there's anything in there, Peter, just because I'm in the screen okay. share mode and I can't really see no it very well. Yep. Perhaps just to get the discussion going, I'll talk again. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be monopolizing things. <laughs> no, we, we, love, we love input, let's do it. 
my own default in individuals who have unprovoked venous thromboembolism who are at low risk of bleeding is to recommend long-term therapy, uh, typically with a direct oral anticoagulant rather than uh, warfarin. Okay. No one, no one else volunteering. So absolutely. So, uh, you know, we there's actually quite a bit of variance as to how long people are treated in, in this kind of context. The, the general guidelines and minimums have really been about at three months uh, minimum and then discussion of, of onwards uh, to sort of long-term risk of recurrence compared to their bleeding risk. Um, you know, there are clear, there is clear evidence that, you know, six versus three months, the, the six, the six week treatment uh, arm had a higher recurrence rate. And, and therefore this is where three came out. Six has been used in many of the, uh, some of the validation to, uh, tools for risk stratification. They were assessed at the six month mark. And so there's really been no consensus as to, you know, the, the sort of minimum duration of therapy, I, I suppose, meant some centers doing three, some centers doing six. But, um, you know, the, the agreement has been in that many of these patients are higher risk for occurrence. And, and in the absence of a reason or major issue that would put them at high bleeding risk, many are, uh, you know, put forward for long-term anticoagulation. And uh, I, I do agree, uh, you know, in the grand scheme of things for bleeding risk reasons, uh, you know, we have evidence of, of lower bleeding risk with DOAX rather than warfarin specifically for, uh, you know, things like CNS hemorrhage that, that would be preferable to warfarin independent of the general pain in the butt uh, that is to monitor uh, warfarin with its interactions. Um, so on that note, so, you know, you've commented that you, most of your patients are going out, out on long-term uh, therapy. Uh, are, are you aware of any ways that, uh, you know, you can try, try and select for patients that might be able to come off uh, anticoagulants, you know, at, at the three or six month mark or, or at a time uh, if you think <laughs> that, that wouldn't require you to keep going for years and years. Is that directed towards me? Or, or no, just in general, <laughs> I, I'm, more, I'm more than happy for you to take it if you'd like to, uh, but uh, I do also encourage other input too from other people if anyone wants to, but if, you're, if you'd like to go, go forth and conquer. There are, there are validation, sorry, excuse me. There are risk scores, but they're difficult to apply Pragmatically is really only one that's been well validated as far as I'm aware, which is her do too. Um, I would feel uncomfortable applying that here because she is because she is older, 62 years old, and I don't and I don't think her do too performed as well in older in older women uh, compared to younger ones, um, uh, even if they only have one point on the base of their age being 65. So I probably wouldn't apply that here. Additionally, getting their particular D-dimer assay is not pragmatic. Fair enough. So you, you've kind of mentioned, and there's many studies. Uh, so HERDU2 has been validated, and there are many studies looking at, uh, you know, uh, on therapy and post-therapy or serial D-dimers uh, from McMaster and from the, the group of Italians, uh, Pallaretti and colleagues, uh, that looked at this. Um, so you're absolutely right. HERDU2... Uh, was applied at six months. It was an Ottawa, Ottawa group that ran it. And they did, uh, basically the full roof rule was any men uh, unprovoked clot continues onwards because they're not able to find any, any, any low risk group. And they were trying to find low risk groups of women by applying the HERDU2 acronym uh, with anything less than two points. So one or zero or one points being, uh, you know, considered lowish risk in the, in the two to 3% range. Um, so, the, there are certain caveats or quirks about applying it. The main struggle is really with sort of the D-dimer that was chosen for validation uh, of this study. So they did use a Vitus D-dimer, which is not widely available across Canada, um, which can make it difficult to, to believe or apply that study, um, especially because we know that sort of cross, cross D-dimer assays is not the most, uh, the most reliable kind of thing. Um, but if you have somebody who is low risk, is young, is not obese, has no, uh, is female, has no, you know, post-thrombotic symptoms, uh, you may be able to consider them even without that factor, given that if their score is zero, um, even if they had a positive D-dimer assay, you, you may be able to consider them still in the low risk group. Uh, I do admit that uh, the 
D-dimer group, D-dimer assay ones are extremely yeah. painful uh, to bring back patients enough, often enough or, or to do them enough to get, uh, ensure that they, they are following that. But, um, you know, a, a single D-dimer, I, I guess there was a, there's a difference between the McMaster group and the Dodds study versus the, the Italians. The Italians showing that if, uh, uh, an on-treatment and, and rapid succession D-dimer is at like 15, 30, 60, 90 days was, was reasonable uh, to, to uh, find a lower risk group. Um, in patients that uh, did not necessarily have residual vein obstruction, they did treat the people that had an ultrasound showing residual crud in the veins for a year prior to applying, that, applying this. Um, and uh, Although when, when a similar thing with just a, a follow-up D-dimer in about a month uh, was tried in McMaster, they didn't really have this low low rate uh, that they could uh, they, they could hold their hat on. And I'm going to flip over to a few of the things uh, that Peter has in the slides just to discuss. Um, you know, we, we worry about bleeding risk. You know, one to two percent major bleeding for for warfarin, and it has been you know somewhat lower in, in many of the studies that looked at DOAX for extended therapy. So you know our cost, uh, non financial, uh, in terms of bleeding has, has become a, a easier comparator, I suppose, than than uh, to, it's easier to keep people on. So uh, throw up one little uh, question, and for you, for anybody. So what if this was like a popliteal vein DVT and, you know, after, you know, five days of our own liquid heparin bridging onto orphan, she became completely asymptomatic and uh, she can't afford a dog. Because this, this is, that's like a normal case, right? That's something we see every week. Anyone have any comments about that? So it's, it's like, I think you have to think about that. You have to think about the, the nature of the event, the patient's value. Uh, uh, she's gonna like, she had like four days of pain um, and, uh, and, and now she has to be on warfarin forever. I mean, it's a little, it's not, certainly not gonna save her life um, that those studies have been done. Um, so I, I think that the nature of the clot, the nature, the nature of the index clot uh, makes a lot about what the patient wants. Uh, but also we know the science behind that. So the, if you, whatever clot you prevent, present with is the mm -hmm. clot you're most likely to recur with, right? So someone who has a little palpiteal, palpiteal thing, DVT is unlikely to prevent a sudden death from palmar embolism. Um, I mean, they're much lower chance than someone who presents with a saddle and with some as, as an example. So I think that that yeah, that's why these scores are are useful and the data within them can be used for for different stories. I'll shut up now. No, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, we do we do take that into account in terms of uh, site of site of onset because uh, it's it's much more it's more likely that they will recur at the same. You're absolutely correct. Um, and so uh, you know. For long-term therapy, you know, our, uh, we've had warfarin forever. Uh, we, as is low liquid heparin, but we have some DOACs available now, which now have really predominated in, in taking taking uh, patients forward. Um, so, uh, the uh, the coverage situation really depends on where you are. But I, I can sort of say that in Ontario, we have we can really only get it for six months unless uh, patients really have uh, private drug insurance, which has been a, a long-term struggle. Um, and so, the, you know, warfarin still has a, a major role in, in therapy because patients can't pay for it in those that are high risk or who wish to continue. Um, so, uh, you know, I, we can chat a little bit. Uh, uh, would you dose reduce uh, this, this person at six, uh, you know, at three, six months, uh, you know, to go from rivaroxaban 20 milligrams to 10 milligrams or, or something like that, or, or five BID of a PIX to two point a band to uh, 2.5 BID of a PIX a band. Anyway. We have one vote for, okay. Anyway. <laughs> Fair enough, uh, let's go back here. Single vent DVT, Benway. Oops. 
Great, mine was first. So, um, single single event DDT. Fair enough. So, I, I mean, we have long term data for in both the Pixaban and Ripperoxaban. Uh, for for extending therapy past uh, in the, in this patient population, um, showing that you know they're they're both very effective no matter which dose you you choose uh, at, at preventing recurrent uh, recurrent events, uh, and the the amplify extension looked at a pix two point five bid and the uh, the uh, Einstein choice study looked at rivaroxaban twenty milligrams ten and as aspirin which uh, did what did what aspirin does, which is it does provide some degree of, of risk reduction, you know, about 30 30 percent, uh, but uh, you know it's still quite high compared to actually being on any dose of, of the direct oral anticoagulants. Um, so in this showing again, no major differences between the twenty and ten milligrams of the rivaroxaban, and, and I just state that you know there's no the, these studies were not powered to show. Uh, this one was not powered to show a difference between the 10 and 20 dose. So it's, it's uh, a little bit difficult to interpret in that context. Like you, you, in, you uh, don't actually have, you have evidence that they, they both prevent uh, VTE uh, fairly equivalently in this context, uh, but there's no obvious benefit seen in the study either in terms of bleeding by dose reducing somebody, even though it feels like it should, but again, we don't have the evidence to back that up, but it was, markedly underpowered to show, be able to show something like that. Um, so, it, you know, I, I can ask Peter his practice here, but it, it's quite reasonable in many, many people to, to consider going forth with, long, with the long-term low-dose therapy. Um, you know, certain patient populations, you may, uh, you may consider doing so or not. You know, Mark, you know, quite obese patients, you, you can maybe consider not doing so. Um, there's a specific set of evidence and debate around patients who've had bariatric surgery or other sorts of malabsorption in the whole discussion of one, should you use it in general, or two, then uh, in this context, would we be concerned about getting, getting absorption of the lower dose? Um, and, uh, you know, we at a tertiary center have the luxury of being able to send levels, and that, that is something that is really not available across Canada uh, if we wanted to verify verify that, but it's not been really documented to prove that the level X will protect you and prevent you from bleeding kind of situation, unlike warfarin that we commonly use in INR of two to three. So we kind of just have to take it on faith based on these, and it's not part of clinical practice uh, in, in, our, in what we do. Um, so that's really what I wanted to chat about in, in terms of, of of that, uh, in terms of you know unprovoked VTE, uh, I'm happy to take any any questions. Or if Peter has anywhere thing else that he'd like to go with go with that discussion. Not to just compare my own practice to yours to make sure that I'm kind of doing what you guys are doing at Mac. <laughs> sure. So, sure. so in individuals who have had single events, particularly if those events are not life threatening. So, and I would include in that small PEs, I feel, and especially if they're not obese, I feel comfortable dose reducing. Uh, um, in, in individuals who I see are at higher risk, for example, more than one event in their life or obese. And often I would also say young men who I think are probably higher risk than others and, and at lower risk of bleeding, I tend to leave on full dose. That's, that's, you know, it, it's not a one size fits all, but that's generally where my mind is. Is that reasonable? I, I mean, I think that sounds very, re sounds very reasonable. We, we don't have like excellent evidence to back, to back up exactly which populations to choose. But um, no, I, I think that we, we do something very similar. You know, it's kind of an individual individualized discussion with, with the patient. And, and uh, honestly, we sometimes it's whatever their drug coverage will cover as, as many, we do encounter situations where the Rivarox ban 10 milligrams dose is not covered under the insurance plan in some way, shape or form because it's sort of designated for orthopedic prophylaxis post-discharge. Um, so that there are a few logistical considerations independent of, of the medicine. And, and you know, Ben, I, I, 
don't think I would agree, disagree with anything you said. Um, you know, I, I think these these two extension trials show that the 20 and the 10 and the five uh, twice a day and the two and a half twice a day are really not that different. So I think it's your bias to like uh, to choose uh, uh, higher or lower. It's kind of like omic what happened, rounding up and rounding down. It's kind of like your it's your preference. Um, I, I think a big thing that we often come across is people are self-paying. Uh, we sometimes uh, 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 and they're able and they are they they can do it. They cut the the full dose in half. Um, and so it ends up being a cheaper monthly out-of-pocket expense uh, to go on the low dose. Um, but yeah, all the considerations you mentioned are, 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 are valid. So this question here from uh, Jennifer Landry, um, do any of the hereditary factors change your mind about reduced dose prophylaxis? Anyone want to tackle that before Rick does? I don't test for, for uh, any of the hereditary factors unless I think it might impact an individual's children's childbearing uh, uh, questions. That's the only time I would test for it. So I would say the answer typically is, is no, I don't. Uh, that doesn't impact my decision-making. Thank you. Uh, so I, I'm going to be honest and say that Again, like the, there are likely are a bunch of patients that have thrombophilias that we don't know about. You know, it's fallen generally out of favor to test patients for large panels of thrombophilias, um, and you know there is evidence for things like factor five are, are one of the, mo the most common one that we detect that it's not particularly predictive of recur recurrent thrombo thrombosis rather than the initial event itself. So it doesn't make a huge difference to me. Uh, I honestly go more on you know personal risk risk of the patient in terms of, you know, uh, what kind of clot it was, uh, unprovoked, unprovoked, you know, are they, are they obese? What meds can they take? Uh, it doesn't make a huge difference in terms of dose reduction. I, I think it's okay. Uh, it, they seem highly effective no matter which dose we choose and in, in the population. So I'm comfortable with it. Yep, I, I, I would agree. And then the next follow-up to that is, did either of those studies exclude submassive or massive PE populations, or were they all comers? Uh, I, I mean, I, I don't think they excluded. I don't think they excluded these these people, if you have to recall. Um, but like, ultimately, we're making this decision at like six, you know six months down the road. So you know, if they if they live through this event, then it's it, you know the only way this would make you worried is that they might be more likely to occur as a, a PE, large PE again. Um, but I don't. I think it was, I don't think it uh, would, may have a major effect on my plan. Uh, I would, uh, sometimes it, sometimes the patient uh, has a strong feeling about, about this and, and it's very nervous about it if they've had a major life-threatening pulmonary embolism. And, and I, I do admit that many patients prefer to stay on the, the higher dose uh, just from an anxiety and peace of mind perspective. That's very clear. So yeah, Ben said the inclusion criteria was equipoise, and that's correct for Einstein choice. Amplify extension um, took people mostly from the Amplify trial, where 90% of the people had unprovoked. So sort of just like uh, uh, Rick's case, uh, unclear unprovoked venous thrombosis was made up most of Amplify uh, uh, extension. So Einstein choice, remember, started after um, uh, 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 Amplify extension was published. So that's why it includes the aspirin on because you wouldn't be comfortable randomizing someone to placebo. Um, and likewise, if someone had uh, an unprovoked uh, event, um, clearly unprovoked, you know, you wouldn't really have equipoise uh, based on Amplify extension of what it, to put them on, right? So Einstein choice had a lot more people with sort of weaker risk factors in them than just no risk factors, which is why the trials are a little bit different. Any other comments or just, just a comment about splitting? Like my, my only thing is I always recommend that they actually buy a nice pill cutter because it's actually really hard to do that uh, manually. 
correct. The, the real rock spin slips a lot. It's like a smarty. It slips. Um, so let's just get a get a bit complicated because that. So what if this person uh, in Rick's case, because we have another three minutes to talk, uh, what if they just flew from uh, uh, from uh, the Middle East to uh, 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 to Canada uh, before they got this this DVT? Um, would you uh, the same woman uh, um, unprovoked DVT, except this time it was um, uh, after a sort of nine hour flight uh, back from uh, uh, what, what would you do? Would you call that a pro case and say her risk of recurrence is, is no and she can stop or how would, how would you approach that? Chat answer. Uh, flight flight risk doesn't really count as a provocation for for me. It's there. So certainly, if it, if the flight duration was less than your a uh, couple of net Netflix marathons, it's probably probably not a huge risk factor. <laughs> Especially during COVID. <laughs> so so I think that's sort of where uh, Einstein choice is useful. So. Someone like that would have been allowed to be an Einstein choice, right? So that patient would not have been allowed to be an amplified extension. Um, well, they could have been, but, but they probably would not have been. Um, but this is the kind of patient that they encourage to be an Einstein choice, which is why um, it, it sort of gives us a little bit of an answer. And if you go, Rick, you want to just go up to my like uh, sure. ESC uh, slides? Um, the, the... Uh, which one, sorry, this one? Oh, next one? Next one. Oh, oh yes, one. yes. Okay, yeah, this. So the European Society of Cardiology and their PE guidelines, which were published in 2019 after Einstein Choice came out, classified these sort of risks as low, intermediate, and high risk, and they, they're listed over there, right? So, you know, high is easy, we know what to do. Low is easy, we know what to do, three months and stop. Uh, and the intermediate are always the hand wringing thing. So, what should we do with those with those people? Uh, and the, the, the intermediates, a lot of them were uh, included in these extension trials, specifically uh, Einstein choice, and that's sort of where sort of the low dose with its low bleeding risk probably becomes becomes a bit more appetizing. There's something in the chat. Uh, do you have suggestions for 50 year old moderately obese female and River Rock spent 10? the past 10 years for one unprovoked DVT and five uh, superficial thrombophobitis, two superficial thrombophobitis episodes. Now has a new two centimeter mid GSV superficial thrombophobitis with your adjusted dose already added topical NSAIDs. Thanks. What do you think, Rick? So someone on, uh, on Rev 10 for extended prophylaxis gets superficial thrombophobitis. I, I mean, if somebody is breaking through uh, with, with new thrombotic events, even though they're minor, I think it's very reasonable to, to try them on the full dose, the, the 20 milligrams, and, and see if this will prevent them from developing these, these further events. Um, I, the, I, would, I would adjust it uh, in this particular case. Yeah, so I, I, I agree. I, I've seen uh, superficial thrombophobitis breakthrough full dose anticoagulation also. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's something that recurs. Um, so, uh, you know, I think you can certainly treat them with a high dose uh, acutely. And then, you know, I, I, after some time, would you go back to low dose again? I, I think about it. Um, there are recurrent superficial thrombophobitis is a very frustrating condition to me because there are, there's not really a lot of great data uh, on anything being great. Uh, and people who have one are generally have more. Um, it's just when. Um, so uh, this is this is a pretty frustrating case. There, there's some weak literature um, on statins reducing the risk of superficial thrombophobitis. Uh, there's some weak literature on some herbals as well, like uh, uh, turmeric um, and uh, something that you can buy in the United States called quercetin, 
uh, which is uh, inhibits tissue factor according to the verbal literature. So uh, I, I share your frustration with this case. I've had, I have a lot of patients like this. It's a frustrating thing. Yeah, compressions, if they tolerated, uh, can, are, are helpful. Weight loss has also been shown to reduce recurrence. Uh, walking program also. Thankfully, we're back into the weather where people stop complaining about wearing their compression stockings. So. <laughs> <laughs> different version of the, the joke that used to make in Toronto is two, two seasons, winter and construction. <laughs> and thrombosis is two season, two seasons, compression stockings and no compression stockings. <laughs> Any other questions from anybody? Yeah, so, so, so just on this slide that you're showing right now, um, yeah, and, and, and I've seen this before, estrogen and pregnancy being put in the same category as a long haul flight. I, you know, recognizing that, that in the reverse trial, estrogen was not a huge predictive factor. I still, for whatever reason, regard estrogen as, as a good enough reason to stop anticoagulation for, for, for long term, I guess in, in most, but not all, but most situations. But flights, I don't, you know, even, you know, nine, 10 hour ones, personally, I don't, I don't count. Um, is that, that, that's my own practice. And I, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. I also uh, uh, see this about um, inflammatory conditions. So active, active autoimmune disease, et cetera. If, if uh, my own practice, again, is that if a clot occurs in the context of an active autoimmune story, someone's having a lupus flare, they get a clot in that context, I typically, you know, minimum three months and until the autoimmune disease has settled, assuming there's nothing else going on, like antiphospholipid but antibody syndrome. I don't typically extend, assuming, you know, they're now on methotrexate and their and their and their flare is controlled. I'm wondering what your thoughts are. I, I, this is all a matter of de of degrees because it's like you know, as as Peter mentioned, like the low and the highs are a slam slam dunk. Uh, and all of these sort of reverse, these risk factors in the intermediate group have sort of differential degrees of, of uh, you know, risk. Uh, and, and so some, you know, whether estrogen is, you know, probably does confer a degree of risk uh, versus versus a flight, but they are, none of them are, are like the, as low as you, you just had an orthopedic fracture and, and uh, we're got a hip replacement or something of the sort. Um, so, you know, it, it is uh, uh, often a judgment call in sort of the clinical scenario and other risk factors which may go into it. But, um, you know, I, I do agree that, you know, I, I also, you know, treat estrogen a little bit more as more of a risk factor than, than flight risk, but it really is sort of into, the, into the, the gestalt of the patient itself. And in terms of like an inflammatory bowel disease, lupus flare or something, uh, if it does occur in the setting of a, a you know a massive uh, exacerbation of it, and then they're on a biologic and everything is amazing thereafter, uh, you know that is that is a justification to say that you know that that risk factor, you know, while always having the potential to recur, is at that is at much lower risk than than any time in the past, and you can justify stopping in that context. Sure. Um, yeah. So I the only thing I would add is sort of estrogens risk. Um, depends on how long the patient has been on it. So it's far higher in the first year and then it kind of lowers. It doesn't go to zero, but it does lower. And so this is sort of clouded a little bit of the, uh, the unprovoked literature. So in other words, if you've been on the oral contraceptive pill for three years, then you are allowed to be in the unprovoked trials that were conducted by Rick's and my mentors in the, in the, in the, in the 80s, okay? Uh, in early 90s. So uh, like Durac and uh, all those trials included people quote unprovoked who were on the oral contraceptive pill for more than a year. Less than a year, no, but more than a year, yes. So I think um, that, that, so estrogen is a little bit fluid um, depending on 
uh, how long they've been on it uh, as, as a risk. And I completely agree if that if autoimmune disease is quiescent, then your risk factor is going away. Um, there's a question here. Uh, by not traveling, this would be reversible risk for treating with travel. So I guess what we're saying with travel is that in, in studies like Einstein Choice, travel did not excuse you for being riskless for a recurrence in the future, right? So it wasn't as high as not having a risk at all, uh, but it was not uh, as low as having a major reversible risk factor like a hip fracture. So it's, it's a, it's a it, this table, in a, if you read the paper in detail, it sort of goes from the highest risk at the bottom uh, to the lowest risk of recurrence at the top, right? And so their guidance sort of says, full dose or warfarin for the bottom, uh, stop after three months for the top, and then uh, consider uh, extension in the middle people. And if you are gonna extend, uh, consider, uh, consider low doses that's acceptable. So, so that's sort of how you think about it is it's, it's uh, where you're moving in this gray scale of risk from high risk to the bottom and the low risk at the top. So, so, so travel is not, doesn't mean nothing. Uh, but it does mean, but, but it doesn't mean everything, <laughs> okay, as far as risk of thrombosis. We, we don't have any good evidence that, you know, treating someone who's stopped blood thinners in the past for like a day or two of their flight uh, has a major difference on, on uh, thrombotic risk as to your question. Do you do that? Do you do that? What's that? Do I do that? Um, yeah, like, let's say this patient... Uh, you saw her and at the end of that, she had a popliteal clot. Uh, and at the six months you saw her and she decided she doesn't want to be on work and she can't afford uh, a long-term DOAC. And then she calls you like two years later to say, okay, Rick, I'm flying to Australia. What should I do? <laughs> uh, if, they've, if, they've, if they've gone through the effort to, to end up reaching me, uh, they're usually pretty, uh, pretty worried about it. And, and so I, I, I I do tend to give them a short course for their, their travel, their extremely long travel, uh, knowing that it doesn't, I think the risk to the patient is very low for a, a few doses and, uh, you know, it's out of unclear efficacy. Um, I did see a very, the evidence was not very good. There are a couple of poor quality studies suggesting a slightly lower thrombosis rate. If you do actually wear like dig diligently compression stockings for these kinds of uh, 20 hour adventures to Melbourne. Uh, but, uh, so I always tell them to wear their, uh, wear compression stocking and if they feel like it and really want it, I, I do give them a short course of, of a low dose Sorry to put you on the spotlight. <laughs> do you as well? Absolutely. <laughs> and no evidence for aspirin with travel. Uh, no, I don't think there is. I don't think it's ever even been studied. I'm not aware of anything. How do you treat for travel? Rick, how do you treat for travel? Uh, if, I, if you do treat for travel, how many days? Uh, I, honestly, I usually give them three, I usually give them three days. For, I mean, if they're for three days for, for that, uh, you know, generally it's been an entire day in flight. So day before, day off, day after, and then call it a day. Yeah, I, I just say, you know, take, uh, take, take your pill on the way to the airport and that's it. And <laughs> take your pill on the way to the airport on the way back. And, you know, I, I tend to use River Rocks 10 milligrams because it's, um, it's, 24 hour story. And that usually, that's usually what I do, but that, I'm not saying that's right. I also use Riva 10 just for its, you know, ease of use once dailiness. Yeah. yeah. Thank you everybody. Have a, have a memorable remembrance day. Take care. Thank you, Peter and Rick. We really appreciate you. Thank you everybody for joining us.